This is a command performance. Brother John Gage asked me if I could uh, teach two classes on Greek grammar and two classes on Hebrew grammar, basically beginning Hebrew and beginning Greek grammar. So I'm going to try to do that. <clears throat> I've been teaching Greek and Hebrew for more than 50 years. I always said that uh, the Hebrew grammar was a, and the Greek grammar was a horrible death. Boring and long, and yet I did that. I had uh, nine years of Greek in class and six years of Hebrew in class. I had uh, five years of Greek grammar and I had three years of Hebrew grammar and three years of advanced reading and research. And I have done many books. As a matter of fact, I did, I have uh, written an in linear from Greek into English of every book in the New Testament. And I have taught those books in class uh, by Hebrew reading and research by induction. In other words, you learn Greek by, by doing it. And that's basically what I've done. I will take off a little bit every now and then in my classes and give you a little bit of Hebrew grammar or Greek grammar and, and go with that. Up here on the wall, there are... Uh, one, two, three, four, almost five shelves of Greek alone. I have many Greek grammars and Greek analinea, I'm not, uh, Greek uh, analytical lexicons and then word studies. There is absolutely a tremendous amount of work that you can do. I'm going to say this before I get started very much. I was hurt in 1970 in the oil fields and was pretty much paralyzed for a time until my back was fused together. And I began to study Greek and Hebrew. I took every extension course I could take and would travel to extension seminaries when I could. The seminary that I was going to go to was California Missionary Baptist Institute uh, in Bellflower, California. I took all of their extension courses and all of the extension courses in uh, Texarkana. And I had a pretty good education before I ever walked in the seminary door. I had all of my basic Greek and Hebrew and also English. I didn't have to take anything. I took no remedial classes. I was a, salt, or a freshman the first year in, in the seminary, and I was a junior the second year, and I was a graduate student from then on. But I went 12 years. I just did not ever want to quit going to the seminary. I've never stopped studying. The very first week I ever walked in the seminary doors, uh, Dr. Travis Hubbard and Dr. Carl Farrar appointed me as their substitute teachers. The very first week that I went there, both of them got sick and I had to take their classes. One of them was advanced theology and the other one was advanced Hebrew reading and research and advanced Greek reading and research. I let me show you something. This is the book of Revelation. This was my doctor's thesis in 1980. It is uh, 656 pages plus illustrations. Every book in the New Testament, there it is typed out, but every book in the whole New Testament is like this. I don't know what page I'm on. I'll take this up to you. And 
in red is the Greek and then the translation of it, then all the grammar down below it. All the page numbers for the, on, the, on the different lexicons and analytical lexicons are there also. Before I went to seminary, about 75% of these books were finished. I want you to understand that. I started reading Greek from a UCL text. A UCL text is all capitals. This is the only text I could find at that time. I'll let you see that. Now this text is all capitals, no breaks. And I went through the whole New Testament and I broke down every word. And I wrote it in, in little red parentheses around each word. In 1975 and 76, I went to the, the Middle East on an uh, archaeological tour and part of my education. When I went to the seminary class and I sat there for the several weeks that I was there, and I would be teaching at least one or two classes a month in all of these classes, the Greek and the Hebrew, and the advanced theology. And I would have the boys read, and I would do that, and then I would tell the grammar of every word, and I and they were having a hard time staying up. My son was about 12 years old, my oldest boy, and he was reading Greek better than some of them were, and they were preachers. And they always used to say to me, it's easy for you, because you're a genius. Now, I was a genius. I very, had a very high IQ, way high genius. But I asked my students, how many of you have done one book in the New Testament? written it down in Greek and did it and, you know, translated the whole thing and they just look, looked at me blank. I said, well, I've done 75% of the books in the New Testament. That's why it's easy for me. I could rattle off the page number on and the lexicons where they were because I had written them down thousands of times. Ace, page 119, analytical Greek lexicon. In, page 137. You did, I just, these things, Kai, page 208. I had written these things so many times that I knew the page numbers were wrong, and I knew all the grammatical explanations of them. Because I'd written it down. And so I said, I challenge you to do one book. Now, to receive your doctor's thesis in Greek and Hebrew, either one, doctor of Bible languages, you had to translate one book in the New Testament, one major book. It couldn't be Jude, or First and Second Peter. It had to be one of the Gospels, or Acts, or the book of Revelation, or Romans, or something. I did them all. I did 27 of them, so maybe I had 27 doctrines. <laughs> I don't know. And in the, the Old Testament, you had to translate the book of Genesis. They just specified the book of Genesis. I did Genesis, and Exodus, and... Uh, oh, Jeremiah and Malachi and Jonah and several other books and then a whole lot of Ezekiel and Daniel. And I just loved it. I just relished in it. As you go down here, there's one, two, three, four whole shelves, six feet wide, four shelves of Greek. And then there is one, two, three, four, five, six shelves of Hebrew with all the Hebrew grammar. Now I know I'm boring you to death with all this. But there is nothing that's going to help you learn Greek or Hebrew except elbow grease and hard work. That's all I can say. One of my students, uh, Ken Blinn, went back to, to Louisville, Kentucky, to the seminary. And he took Greek and Hebrew. 
And when he went in there, they started putting pressures on his board. He said, oh yeah, there's an ace, extension or limitation of thoracic verbal action. And the teacher looked at him and says, what? He said, that's a grammatical rule of ace. He said, we don't teach that here. They said, this is baby Greek. So, out of maybe 3,000 classes out there I have on Greek, you will get involved in some of this for more than 20 something years of video recordings. And you can learn it a little more painlessly than just studying the grammar. Now, here's the grammar that I have written. A Greek grammar is called a brief Greek grammar of the New Testament. And inside of it, there is, it's brief, that's all I can say. It's very rudimentary and very uh, plain. My <clears throat> Greek teacher was German. He was a genius also. Except he studied one grammar, this one. Now this one, I've had to reinforce this leather back. This is Davis's Greek grammar of the New Testament. Now, a lot of the greatest language scholars were German. And they tried to pronounce Greek and Hebrew as if it was German. A lot of the Hebrew that we have today is a, what we call, might be a leftover from the, their stay in Germany. They pronounce the Hebrew alphabet and a lot of Hebrew in Yiddish or in German pronunciation. The same thing with Greek. Now, <clears throat> I asked my uh, Greek teacher, and not playing him down at all, because he was a great man, but he uh, told me, I said, uh, brother, I said, are there any Greek grammars in Greek? Oh, no. That's what he told me, no. I said, are, are there Greek terms for grammar? No. Like that. Well, <clears throat> a lot of preachers have a lot of books on their, on their shelves, but I read them. And that's okay. Read them. Now here is a great big Greek grammar by A.T. Robertson, and by the way, A.T. Robertson was a genius and a great scholar, but most of what you see that, that's got A.T. Robertson's name on it was not really his work. It was John A. Broadus, his father-in-law. John A. Broadus was one of the greatest Greek scholars of all time. Now this is basically a revision of John A. Broadus's work. It is a, a grammar of the Greek New Testament in the light of historical research by A.T. Robertson. And it's big. Really, really big. Around uh, 1,450 pages or so. Liddell and Scott up there is over 2,000 pages. That's profane and ecclesiastical Greek. I studied profane and ecclesiastical Greek. When I went to the Middle East, I could read the ancient writings because it was in Eunsios, and that's how I learned it. Now, in my little Greek grammar, and if you want one, on the website in the bookstore, there is a brief grammar of the Greek New Testament by Dr. James Phillips, and I can send you a e-copy of it an e-book copy. It's not very big. But in my little tiny Greek grammar, which is not in Davidson grammar, I give you all the Greek grammatical terms also. Now, I give you in here, in the first two stories in here, our little thesis in the beginning of this, I tell you the history of the Greek text. And I give you a history, a brief history of the Bible. And there, now Greek goes back way back in time. Back in what we might call the 
Well, before Christ, long way before Christ. The great Greek, right? we have classical Greek, which is beautiful language, and Koine is a lot like that. A lot of people try to say Koine is only has five cases, but it has eight. Nominative, genitive, obviously, vocative, instrumental, dative, accusative, and vocative, and so does classical. So does Sanskrit, also has eight cases. Now, you go way back, and they were what we call uh, the dialects of Greek. That what we call the Ioning and the uh, what we the Hellenistic and the Athenian, the Attic. And from these different areas, you can find where words become. And as you look in the Greek and and uh, lexicons, uh, you'll see it'll be Ionic or it'll be. Uh, some different area where it came from in one of the uh, different colonies of the Greek speaking people. God used the most perfect language in the world to put the New Testament in. That's all I can say. Every word in the New Testament is inflected in some way. Inflected means it has an ending. In the participles, you have eight cases. Plus, a participle is kind of a, a noun and a verb combination. A participle is some kind of what we call one of them continuing things. It'll tell you nominative is the case of the subject. In modern Greek, you have the subject and the object. In English, you have subject and object. But in Greek, you have nominative, genitive, ablative, locative, instrumental, dative, accusative, and vocative. You have got eight cases. Mm -hmm. The nouns how are all inflected, and the names, the verbs are all inflected. Now, if you go back in Greek, in the Greek language, you're going to go back to eight cases in the Old Greek. That's Old Greek, Pale, Hellas, Old Greek. Now, these eight cases uh, brought down to today, Greek evolved. You have the different territories where the Greek language evolved. Then you have the classical Greek. And then Alexander the Great came along, the son of Philip of Macedon. And he came along and he basically conquered the whole known world right there. And he gave them a Koine Greek. Koine means common. He gave them a common language and a common government and a common democracy. The word ecclesia was a very important, in, in the Greek New Testament, ecclesia means church, once called out, ek and kalio. But ecclesia was a, a city-state under a big government. The big government appointed city-states that they could um, locally make their own decisions. They would have drafts, they would have taxes, they would have whatever. The ecclesia was elected by the people. A democracy, a rule by the people. We got our democratic government basically from that, at least from the European Western world. The, the Greek culture went from classical it went from territories, it went into classical Greek, then it went into Koine Greek, and then Koine Greek uh, ruled from about 330 B.C. to about 330 A.D. Then the Catholic Church tried to take the Bible out of the hands of the people, and they did not want them to know the language of the Bible, which was Greek. And they denounced the Greek language, and they, 
then we have Jerome translating the New Testament and the Old Testament into Latin. Latin is the legal language of the Roman Empire, of the Holy Roman Empire, or you might call the Unholy Roman Empire. Then, around 13 to 1500 A.D., we have Byzantine, the Byzantine Greek, even 700 and 800. The Byzantine Greek is different than Koine. Mm -hmm. Now, when Constantine became the ruler of the Roman Empire, he brought with it Christianity. And he had 50 Bibles translated, or written that is, in Greek, in Eusios. And of those 50 Bibles that he had translated in about 320, 330 AD, three of them are still in existence. The Codex Alexandria, Sinaiticus, and Vaticanus. We have a, uh, a group today, they're, they call themselves King James only, or the, the only inspired Bible was King James. The King James Bible was written for the Church of England for King James. It was not written for Baptists, it was written against Baptists. It was an anti-Baptist book, by the way. It was an anti-Catholic book. If you look in the preface to the King James, original King James Bible, it will denounce the Baptists that are beating everything out on their own animals from the original languages. And then you'll have the Popish people that didn't have a Bible. They don't want the Bible. They, they have forbidden the Bible. I could put up my church history chart up here and show you some of that when all this took place. The Catholic Church forbid the Bible to be possessed by anyone or even to have a page of it. Baptists fought for the preservation of the Bible for over 1,500 years. Now we're leading up to Greek grammar. I'm telling you a little history of the text of the Bible. The Geneva Bible was a, a Bible by the, the great Protestant reformers. By the way, almost the text of almost all of these early Bibles was from the, uh, the Latin Vulgate. The Latin Vulgate is right here. Jerome translated that. Now, I'm going to show some things to you here that I have to walk around a little bit. Hopefully I won't bump the camera. Here is a page of the original King James Bible in 1611. This is literally a page from 1611. It is uh, from the writings of Jeremiah and then also here is a another page of a Bible in 1600 and uh, 28 which goes almost back to there, and this is Theodore Beza's translation of the scriptures. This was one of Calvin's students. Those are old books. Looking up here, Here is another very old book. 
This book is written in 1766. This is a Latin, a Greek to Latin inter, or what we might call a lexicon. The writing in some of this, besides mine, is uh, is all quill. And in some places here, you'll see writings or writers that added something here. There's one in 1814. There, a man wrote his name. That's an old book. I have history books over there from the 1700s. I look at these. I've taken issue with Thayer at times and some of the other Greek lexicographers because they were wrong. <laughs> and I can prove they're wrong. They made mistakes. I make mistakes. But I read all of these books. A lot of preachers have them on their desks. One preacher one time came to me and he says, uh, I'm, I'm teaching the book of Hebrews and some of my students are really smart and one of them called me out today and said such and such and such and such and such and, and, and Brother Jim, what's the answer? I said, do you have Colin DeLeash? Yeah, I have it, but I can't read it. To re learn to read Colin DeLeash, which is those 10 volumes right over there, you have to know German, you have to know Latin and Greek and Hebrew. If you learned several of the ancient languages, you'd only have a license to learn. That's what my teachers told me. I got a license to learn. I did it. That's the thing. I translated the scriptures. And it is so alive. The scriptures will straighten out all of your errors from the original language. It, if you go with it, it'll straighten out what you believe. It'll make a modified Calvinist out of you. It won't make a hyper-Calvinist, it's going to make a modified one out of you. It'll straighten out your understanding of what baptism is. Baptizo. The Latin equivalent is mergio, which in our word immerse comes from that. Baptism is not rontizo, sprinkling, and it's not nipto, pouring. It is baptizo, immersing. That just took care of that right now, didn't it? Now we know that baptism is not sprinkling and pouring. It's an immersion, because that's what the Bible says. We have a wonderful book. It's our instruction manual. But it was not written in English. There are many English translations of it, but they are translations. One of the books that I have studied with in the New Testament is A.T. Robertson's uh, uh, Word Pictures of the New Testament. Very good. He gives you all types of historical references and things. Great. A great commentary. The Greek grammar is a grammar of science and medicine. The Latin is a, is a language of legalities because the Catholic Church was in control and they brought in Latin. Everybody had to write their doctors and masters and bachelors, bachelor's theses in Latin. The educated language is Latin. The Catholic Church brought on the dark ages where people could not read and write. The Baptists kept on reading and writing in Greek and Hebrew. At one time in history, a Baptist pastor had to memorize all four Gospels in the original language. And the whole Psalm and the book of Psalms in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. That's a big job. Mm -hmm. Most of the Baptists were doctors. And many Baptists were crucified and burned at the stake for witches because they could read and write and they knew medicine. The pastor was a doctor, he was a nurse, and he was a theologian 
of the flock. Many churches only had one or two pages of the Bible. And now we're just telling you the history of the Greek language in the New Testament. In Asia Minor, Turkey, the Baptist Church tried to survive. Now I'm going to show something, something here. As I put this up, please bear with me for a moment. Now, this is very important to see this. That's a chart of church history. It's a chart that tells you the evolution of Catholicism and the doctrines that were bringing in, and they denounced the Bible. They did not want you to read the Bible. Because if you read the Bible, the doctrines that they were bringing into the churches, the Roman Catholic churches, were not according to Scripture. They forbid the use of the Bible. The dogma of the Catholic Church began uh, with our tradition. Our traditions are more important. They used to say they were on equal value with the Scriptures, but of course they said what the Scripture said. You could not read the Scriptures. You were not allowed to have a Bible. In Asia Minor, we have the seven churches of Asia there, don't we? There was a and we're not talking about Constantine the Emperor, but there was a missionary, a deacon missionary called Constantine. He went into Asia Minor, and this, uh, this missionary had a copy of all of Paul's writings, plus some of the Gospels. And these people began, began to be known as the Paulicians. Right here you see the word Paulician. Early Christians were called, called Paulicians. They were called Christians, by the way. They called Cathari. They were called all kinds of things. And they were called Anabaptist because they would not accept anybody else's baptism. The Catholic Church, they said, never had any, had any authority to baptize anybody. If you came to a Baptist church, you were baptized by immersion, by the authority of that church. Now these people, the Catholic Church became very strong and the Catholic Church was killing everybody and taking them to rivers. By the way, they baptized by immersion at that time. They'd hold a knife to your throat and say, would you like to become a Christian, a Catholic? Or would you like to die and float down the river? So, you know, they, that was called for, forced conversions. Well, at about 600 and or 570 A.D., there was a guy born by the name of Muhammad, supposedly. By 623 A.D., he had founded himself a religion and copied the Catholic Church very much because he started to convert people by the sword. He extorted money from them. He, he kidnapped people. They raped and pillaged. And by the way, the Catholic Church was raping and pillaging and running all into the Middle East. And the Islam world, Islamic world was raping and pillaging going all the way the other way. And the Baptists were caught in the middle. The Baptists in Asia Minor and all those churches, they were destroyed by Islam. And even Catholicism. You know, Constantine uh, took the the Roman Empire from Rome and put it in Constantinople, named after himself. Mm -hmm. And then the Muslims took it over. All this time, the, the Baptists are running for their lives and trying to preach the Word of God and trying to preserve the Holy Scriptures. And they were in Greek. Some of them took off in the valleys of the Piedmont. There's a book over there, a history book, written in 1600 and around the middle of the 1600s by Samuel Moreland. 
the ecclesiastical history of the church of the valley of the Piedmont. He names the people that live there. And the people in the valleys of the, the church, people in the churches in the valleys of the Piedmont had, had migrated from Asia Minor, from Turkey, from the seven churches of Asia, and gone into Europe. And they had tried to live and carry out their lives quietly. Finally, the Catholic Church found out that there were some people, weird people, living up in the, in the, in the, in the Piedmont area. And they went in there, they burned all of the scriptures, and some of them, they say, were the original autographs. They burned them. They burned the people at stakes. They raped the women. They cut their breasts off, fried them, and ate them. And the Catholic Church was supporting all of this all the time. They had run from the Muslims, and they'd run from the Catholics, and now they were finally caught. Some of these people escaped into Russia, China, and Germany. And they were called Wiedertoppers there in Germany. That means rebaptizers or Anabaptists. The Mennonites and the Amish came from these people. Many of them came to America. They come some through China, some through Russia, some from Germany. And they established a lot of little colonies from one end of the country to the other, the east and the west coast. They look all alike, they wear the same clothes, and they are very religious people. Just like those Paulicians were so many years ago. In church history, church history is also a history of the history, is a history of the Bible. Because you wouldn't have the Bible if it weren't for these Baptists that brought it down to you through all these years. All the scriptures originally were handwritten. My New Testament is handwritten. My Old Testament is handwritten with my hand. There are 144 classes that I did from the book of Genesis, and our guests are somewhere around 2,800 to 3,000 classes that I've done on New Testament. I've done every book in the New Testament. If you look on Sermon Audio, every book in the New Testament Greek reading and research is there, the classes. I am finishing the book of Acts now. I'm in the 26th chapter of the book of Acts. Nearly finished. The Bible is a source book. The Greek New Testament is the source of all translations. even the Latin Vulgate. Now when Jerome translated the Latin Vulgate, Biblica Sacra Vulgata, he had a lot of manuscripts. And he just started translating from them. Some of the manuscripts didn't agree. All of them were handwritten. Some pre preacher's notes were written in there, and he put the notes in there as scripture, which it wasn't. Now, today we have the Nestle Allen text, we have uh, what, what we call uh, the received text, Textus Receptus, which was a very, what we might call corrupt text. It had all these mistakes in it. They advertised the Textus Receptus as the received text from God. Erasmus, the one that translated this one in 1628, the, this very text is 1628, right here. He told the Catholic Church, now he's a Catholic priest, and he was trying to bring the people back to the New Testament Greek. He was alive in the scriptures. He said, man, this is wonderful. It is alive. And it's kind of contrary to what our church is teaching. We need to get the priest back to the Bible and away from this dogma. We need to get the people believing the New Testament and believing the, the epistles of Paul and the writers of the New Testament. We need the people to get back into the Bible and teach the Bible. 
the Catholic Church uh, was a little upset with him. Especially when he told them that the Latin Vulgate was very imperfect and that he could do a better job and he would do it for them if they wished. And that was the end of the, the straw that broke the camel's back. They denounced him. The man was one of the greatest Latin and Greek scholars in the world that ever lived. He said he didn't study Hebrew because he said his brain just didn't have enough room for it. He's a genius. Great scholar. He never left the Catholic Church, but the Catholic Church left him. Now, this first class is just an introduction to the Greek New Testament and to the Greek language. It's passed from the linguistic colonies in Greek into classical Greek, into Koine Greek, and then into Byzantine Greek, and then into modern Greek, which is not the same language. I hope that you've enjoyed this class. I hope it's been informative for you. Our next class, we're going to get into the grammar just a little bit and into the alphabet of the Greek New Testament, the Koine Greek, which is very close and akin to the classical Greek.